Hi, everybody. Uh, we will start shortly and uh, the session will be in English. <laughs> Don't worry. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to have, to have you here for this talk about analyzing malicious office files. My name is Nicole Fishben. I'm a security researcher at Intezer. And as part of our job is not uh, finding new threats, is also writing and uh, sharing knowledge about how to analyze files, how to detect malware or threats. So you in your organizations will be able to conduct an incident response process or analyze threats that you find in your organizations. And today we're going to talk about office files. Uh, first, we will, we will explain the main types of files. So what are the different features and how they're very handy and useful for uh, regular users, but they can be very dangerous when they're used by attackers. And of course, we're going to show examples uh, like live demos. But why are we talking about Office files? Well, that's because Office files are quite uh, popular among phishing attacks. So they're often delivered in specifically crafted emails. So the emails that have an attachment in a form of an Office file. And the email and both the, both the email and the Office file will lure, lure the, the victim or the user uh, to open the file, maybe click the enable content, and that's how the first stage of the attack is being carried out. And another interesting fact is that phishing, file, phishing and malicious office files are not used only by very sophisticated advanced persistent threats like APTs, but they also used by less sophisticated uh, groups um, that have maybe other uh, goals rather than intelligence or um, data theft. So we'll first cover uh, the format. So the first format that was created is the object linking and embedding, uh, OLE. And these files are formatted as file system in a zip file. So that's what you can see here in the screenshot. It looks like a root entry, and then you have more files underneath. And the associated file, um, file extensions are the doc, PPT, XLS, and so on. Next, we have a newer version. This is the Office Open um, of XML file format. So these formats are uh, an XML zip file. So you can see once again, it looks like a tree, but each uh, instance has actually an XML file. That's a mandatory thing for an open office XML file to have. It must have the XML file. <clears throat> and a few differences between the, all the objects and the open XML files. So first of all, we mentioned the XML file, of course. The second thing um, is that of uh, open XML files cannot be used to store VBA markers. All right, keep that in mind. The, the first thing is that open XML files can be used to store objects like images, like charts, like PE files, and so on. So for example, when you are working on document file and you want to add a chart or a graph, so you can do that, right? And it looks like an Excel chart. So that's, that's basically uh, what is going under the hood. Yeah. Open XML files can have all the objects. And lastly, we have the relationships between different objects. So if you look at the uh, screenshot, you can see the dot rails like over here. So these files will uh, mention what are the re different relationships between the different objects in the XML file. And uh, lastly, we're going to talk about the RTF files. So RTF are basically uh, uh, encoding the text in a way that uh, each user will be able to open the, the file, even if he doesn't have Windows 
or he doesn't have the office suit. And you might ask yourselves, why? Well, and what is the difference between that and text file, right? Because basically text file, right? Um, but the difference is that um, before we had, for example, uh, Google Docs and so on, uh, there was a, a big issue like opening a doc file if I have only Linux or if I have Mac. And RTF is a solution for that. And the difference between an RTF and a text file is that RTF can have um, like fonts and it has images and so on. And what you see here is uh, how RTF looks. So basically uh, it has a format and it's not only gibberish. Uh, it has a specific format with uh, text and control words and control symbols and groups. So uh, we cover the main uh, types files. But now we need to understand how attackers are abusing these files. So first of all, uh, as we mentioned, remember their macros. So here they are. Macros are a very useful tool for productivity, because if you have a repetitive task that you need to do for each document that you create, or each Excel sheet or so on. So macros can automate it. You can either record your actions or you can use um, a scripting language called VBA to uh, write all the commands that you want to do and automate this task saves time. And it's very useful, but it's also very dangerous because threat actors can use these VBAs to execute code on your machine. They can uh, gather information about, your, about the host, they can download more payload and execute it, they can hide itself, hide the malware, and so on. So macros are, um, are enabled in doc files. And actually, the newer version of Microsoft Office and all the Excel file, Excel software, and so on, they have, um, I, I'm sure you're familiar with that, like a banner. So when a file contains VBA, Usually, it will present a banner. This file contains macros, and then you will need to hit enable uh, macros or enable content. And only then the macro will be executed, right? So this was created basically to do like a separation, to, um, to, to disable the, this malicious part. But once again, when we are talking about phishing attacks, the emails, the documents are crafted in a way it makes the user trust this document, he hits the enable content and the macro, the malicious macro is executed. Another important thing is, as I mentioned, open XML files by default, the docx file cannot be used to store VBA, but there is a but. So first of all, we have the doc M with the M, which means macro enabled. So this file can be stored. And another thing, there are ways to bypass this um, restriction. For example, the template injection, we're going to show um, an example of that. And also we have the abusing RELs. So what are the RELs? This is the relationships that we talked about in the previous slides. And in this case, um, it's another way to execute code, even though an open XML file cannot contain VBA. Uh, RTF, RTF formats. So as you saw, RTF is basically a bunch of symbols and groups and words, and it's all based on parsing this format. So when we're talking about parsing, there's probably going to be an error in the parsing. So they have um, different vulnerabilities or different uh, misusing of this parsing that can lead to code execution. We're going to show that as well. And lastly, we have CVEs because we're talking about um, software, right? We're talking about Office, we are talking about Excel, and all of these softwares can have bugs, can have vulnerabilities. So for example, um, one vulnerability is a buffer overflow in the Microsoft Equation Editor, which is a part in the Excel uh, software. And this vulnerability allows um, 
code ex remote code execution when a specifically crafted document is opened by user. So it looks like there are many ways for attackers to abuse these office files. And we need to understand how we as defenders and how, how we as analysts can uh, maybe protect our organizations and detect the malicious uh, office files. So in this case, uh, we have the static analysis and we have the dynamic analysis. Static analysis meaning opening the file and looking at the different parts and uh, maybe deobfuscating the parts that are hidden or try to be stealthy uh, and so on. It's like when we reverse engineer a file, we will try to look at the assembly. The dynamic execution means that we will try to uh, execute the file in a safe environment, like in a VM or a sandbox, and then follow the processes uh, and the networking connections that are made right after the execution. And here there is a problem. So static analysis can be very time consuming because as we're going to see in the examples, some of these files are very heavily obfuscated. And the obfuscation is there to make the analysis harder, to make it more frustrating, time consuming. And so we as analysts, it will take us more time to understand what the file is doing. And the other uh, problem with dynamic execution is that sometimes these files use remote servers, like C2 servers controlled by the attackers themselves. And these servers have a very short um, time when they're alive, I mean the domain. So if you will try to reach this domain after it's already gone, right after when it's offline, we will not see anything, we will not get the payload. So we will miss the whole picture. We will have a malicious office file, but we will not know what is the malware that it's right to, to download. So we will not know uh, who is the threat actor behind this office file. Maybe we're missing a very important piece of information uh, only because the, 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 the server is offline. And when I mean a short period of time, it could be hours, it could be a few days. Um, that's usually what we see. And in these cases, we will have to tackle this problem from another angle. So um, let's go for examples and see how we analyze these files. And I'm going to present several tools. They're all open source tools. Uh, and if not, they will have a community version. So uh, you will be able to use them. So first, I want to show an example of VBA macros. The first, thing, uh, the first tool that we're going to use is called OLED. OLED is part of the um, OLED tools. Uh, created by the college. I'm hope I really hoping that I say the right manner, but excuse me if not. So all the ID is a very powerful tool because when I have an office file, I can get it from example from an email and it will have an extension of doc file. But is it really a doc file? Maybe it's a docx, maybe a doc uh, with the M in the end. I, I don't know. So when I run all ID, I will know for sure because here you see like a summary. So we have the file format here. I know it's actually an Excel file in this case. I know it has um, all the object linking and embedding. embedding. Um, we have um, information about the author. Sometimes it can be very useful to know that, especially if it has a unique character set, like if it's in Russian or Chinese or something like that. We can see here uh, VBA macros. Uh, seems that it doesn't have VBA macros, but it does have the XLM macro. So XLM macro is uh, basically a macros in the Excel. 
Excel is a very powerful tool and they have their own uh, unique option of macros. And it can contain code as well. All right. And it tells us uh, use all VBA. So all VBA, another tool from all the tools, which will um, tell us which macro code uh, the sample contains. We will start from the end. Once again, we see here, we see here the, the table with all the information. Uh, and we see the macro and we see the exec command. So if we go a little bit upwards, we see here something weird. So we have all the cells. Uh, as I said, it's an actually uh, Excel file. And what we see here in red and in blue. So all the VBA is very powerful uh, for many reasons, but one of them is when you see this chunk of, of text, especially in the first times, uh, it might be a little, a little bit confusing of uh, what's going on. So um, it will, sorry. So it will um, highlight the, the important names, the important functions that could be suspicious. So in this case, we have the exec. Looks like it will download MSHTA uh, from a specific domain. As I said, very uh, common for Malvo to do that using the CMD. So in this case, the v in this case, the VBA macro was relatively easy to understand. This blob here is actually a comment. And it's very popular as well for uh, VBAs to contain comments because uh, we have a bunch of charters and it might be very confusing, right? So that's one of the ways to obfuscate a VBA macro. And I want to show another example. So once again, we run all ID. And this time you see it's in red. Right before we had the macro, it was in yellow, so maybe not so dangerous, but all right. Uh, here we see it's in red, we have VBA macro. This time we're talking about doc, um, open, uh, open XML file with the docm, meaning uh, the macros are enabled, right? But we see it only here. The interesting thing is that when I first uh, um, collected this sample, it has uh, doc extension, right? It was submitted to virus total from different people and was uh, used with the doc. And it means to, uh, to confuse the user. And right now we know uh, it has enabled macros. So once again, all of VBA and we get file. And here we see um, more, more information. So uh, you see there, first of all, here, the document open. Meaning as soon as you open the document, something will be executed. What will be executed, we'll see in a minute, but here you see the main functions that uh, say it's something suspicious, right? Because we have to open, we have a binary file, we have create and so on. And of course, basic before for encoding the strings, another very popular method in VBA to obfuscate the strings to make it harder to analyze. We can go a little bit up and see the whole uh, code. So that's actually the code that we're looking at. And it's a little bit more obfuscated than the previous file. Um, we he see here that it tries to, uh, to create a string. And what I want to do now is use all the VBA to get the code so I can open it in text editor. So uh, that's what I'm going to do. All right, so uh, here what I did is just open it in a text editor. And 
we can see here it's a little bit nicer to see when you have the colors. But what actually this sample is doing, uh, it creates a path. So it builds a path right here. And in this section, it will try to um, extract a file that is stored inside uh, this office file, write it into the path that it created here. And over here, uh, basically what it does um, is execute this file. We can get um, a translation of these strings using Cybershare or Python, uh, whatever you prefer. Now, uh, we have a few options right here because we know what it tries to do, but we don't have the actual binary file, right? And we need it. We need it in order to conduct an investigation and understand what is the threat here. So uh, what I want to do is open this file uh, in, for example, in, in a way to debug it. And here is the Microsoft Visual Basic for applications. I can access it from Microsoft Word. Um, so just to show here, um, I think it's right here. If you hit here the developer options, you will have uh, the option to, uh, to open this Visual Basic uh, and debug your VBA code. And I know that hex to str is here will contain uh, the payload that the office file will try to execute. And here in the watch, I actually can see uh, it starts with this program, program cannot be run in DOS. So that's the first line in any PE file. I can extract the file and try to get uh, its hash. Maybe it's detected on virus total, maybe um, maybe other um, security tools uh, already analyzed it and we have a verdict. And if not, if it's a unique malware, then I will have to try to reverse engineer it and understand what it does. And uh, I promise you it's not a self pitch. So stay, stay with me. I just want to show you a way to, to save time. So instead of trying to debug, um, this uh, file and try to extract this payload, I can open up the file in Intezor Analyze. Intezor Analyze is basically an engine for reuse, reuse code reuse, string reuse, IOCs reuse. And here we uploaded the office file, a non-binary file, and it was executed in a sandbox. But instead of me going over the results from the sandbox, in the analyze already did it for me. And it was able to analyze the binary file. And here I can see it's actually ICE ID, a very popular, popular uh, malware. And I can see more information in the TTP section and understand better the behavior of both the office file and the binary. So just by uploading a file, I have a more um, overall picture, overall in this understanding of the threat that um, I'm facing here. All right, so next file. Uh, once again, I will run all ID and I have this time a docx file. Um, all right, and here I don't have macros, but I do have an external relationship. So if we remember, we talked about relationships between objects in like XML files or in open XML files. So here we see it. And Ole ID tells me to use another call, another tool called Ole Obj. And that's what we are going to do uh, on this file. Ole Obj uh, is a tool that extracts all the relationships uh, and objects that are presented in a specific file. Uh, so here I see a link, an external link to this uh, a little bit weird, I would say, uh, domain. 
Now, what I can do is try maybe to access the domain, but from a safe um, environment because it will download a malware and we don't want to get hit uh, with a malware. But uh, I can also try to look it up on VirusTotal on URL house or URL house. And that's what I did. So you can see here um, the URL house result and I see it's agent Tesla. So, um, and you can see that's offline. Uh, so right away, only two comments and I know uh, it's a malicious office file and I know what the threat it delivers. So I can, can continue my investigation. This case was, I would say relatively easy. Now we're going to analyze an RTF file. So RTF files um, can be used or abused in different ways. And we're going to see one of them. Um, just to, to show you um, right away, we see it's an RTF file, but uh, here it, we don't have any more information that would uh, identify this file as malicious. Uh, so I always try to use different tools, try different um, approaches, especially when it's RTF files. So uh, I want to show you um, the Remnux machine. So first of all, Remnux is a very powerful tool because it comes uh, pre-installed with different uh, tools for analyzing uh, files, non-binary files. Uh, networking information and so on. So it's very useful for investigations and uh, analysis. And what I want to do here um, is run a tool called RTF dump. RTF dump is another open source, source tool created by Dider Stevens. And what it will do, um, let's say malicious file, malicious RTF file. Uh, it will it will print all the streams that we have in the RTF. So RTF made up of, made up of different streams, and I want to uh, examine them. So the payload, uh, the output of this um, command might be a little bit confusing. So we will uh, check this level three, uh, this object right here. So what we have is nesting level three, right? Because um, it's right, it's like a tree. It has two children. It starts in this uh, offset right here. That's the um, number of bytes, its length, num the number of hex characters, uh, zero binary data, and 60 unique characters, and its name. For me, this one looks a little bit suspicious uh, because it's quite big. Um, and it contains a lot of data. So I want to further examine uh, this string. Once again, I will use RTF object, sorry, RTF dump. Uh, I want to print the string, uh, the stream, stream number three in hex four, and I want to see what it contains but it doesn't contain any readable or uh, obvious strings, right? So I don't know what it is, but before that, notice uh, this um, sequence of bytes. So what it means, uh, these bytes are actually uh, a signature for an embedded all the file, all the object to be precise. So, when we talked about uh, documents or uh, Word documents that contain charts from Excel and so on, under the hood, it's basically an embedded all the file, all the object, and it will start with this signature. And the fact that this um, object right here doesn't have any uh, readable information, I suspect it's a shellcode. What do we do when we suspect we have a shellcode? We will need to extract this uh, stream and throw, throw it into a shellcode debugger to better understand what it does. So 
At this point, we have an RTF file with an all object that is basically containing shellcode. So what we do next, we will use another tool uh, from the OLE, uh, OLE tools uh, called RTF dump. Oh, sorry, RTF opt. All right, so RTF opt will um, print all the objects that it can find here. And we see two objects, but they're not well form, not a well-formed object. And I will start from analyzing this uh, object right here because it, its index x, its position is uh, closer to the to the stream that I see here, and its uh, children process it, children streams. Sorry. So I will dump this stream. dash s for uh, stream number one and it will be saved right here and in order to analyze this shell code i need to throw it into my windows machine so that's what we're going to do next all right so uh, that's here. Yes, replace. All right, so first thing first, when we have a suspicious uh, shellcode, we need to understand what is um, the address where it starts, EAP, basically. So for that, we will use the XOR search, another open source tool with the dash w. Dash w allows us to find the, uh, the shell code, the 32 bit, bit shell code. And here we see this output and we need, need to look for the get EAP. So that will probably will be um, the, the starting point of the shell code, right? And here we see two results, but they're actually the same. Uh, note that sometimes it might find more than one result, and then you will need to uh, maybe try each of them or just guess, uh, whatever <laughs> will be faster. Uh, anyway, right now we're going to use CSDBG, uh, which is the shell, shell code debugger. And we will pass this address right here because we suspect that that's the starting point of our shellcode. We should run as admin. Hopefully it will work. Well, I'll always do a problem with live demos. <laughs> All right, I I'm not sure why it's not working, but I ran it just before that. Uh, I knew it will not work, but all right, no worries. Uh, so this is actually the same uh, execution of uh, this um, of this shell code, and when it works, so it will show up like that. 
and we can see all the API calls and the function calls uh, made by this shell code. So we'll have, um, it creates a process, right? It uh, loads the URL download. And right here, that's maybe the most interesting part is where it will reach out to this host right here and download a payload and uh, save it to here and execute it. So we had an RTF file uh, with shellcode, and now we know what the shellcode is doing, and we know that the file is malicious. And the tools that we used uh, are the RTF dump, RTF obj, and for debugging the shellcode, we can use either a CSDBG or another open source tool called Blob Runner. Uh, and just to, to show you how it would look in Analyze, uh, instead of uh, analyzing the shellcode and maybe a little bit failing like me here, but uh, we can upload a file and right away see that it's actually an uh, async rat, uh, which is a remote access uh, tool. And we see all the code reviews um, basically in uh, less time than it would take me to, to run this shellcode, but no worries. And the last example that I want to show is the template uh, injection, which is a way to bypass this uh, annoying thing of not having the VBA in the docx. So um, well, that's what we're going to do next. Uh, we'll run all AD and we see here once again, we have external relationships. Uh, so we know what we need to do. We need to run to, uh, all the objects. And here we see uh, maybe a few links, uh, but for me, what looks suspicious is actually the last one because it will try to download um, a dot file, which is uh, a, a template. So once the docx file is opened, it will try to reach to this remote server and download a template. And this template, unlike the docx file, can contain code. And uh, right now, if I will try to reach this uh, domain, it will not work because it's already offline. Uh, but uh, I was able to grab it from Aristotle. So that's file number two. All right, so we can see right away document or template. All right, and we can see the macro. So once again, all of VBA for file number two. Here the table is a little bit longer because we have even more functionality we have more functions uh, that this VBA tries to call. And if we will go a little bit up, it looks much more obfuscated than the samples that we saw before. And actually there are even more obfuscated samples. So you can see it's a very long and obfuscated, of course. Um, but if we open it in a text editor, yeah, it will look a little bit nicer, especially after we will uh, make, make some changes and um, uh, maybe a, a attach a few strings one to another and we have some readable information and we can get a better understanding of what the file is actually doing. And what we can see in the first part is that it will try to gather information about uh, the, the host, about the victim, the, some networking information and so on. And then it will try to disable all the warnings and restrictions of macros. So maybe it's for like um, the next attack on this victim. So uh, we will not have these banners uh, saying that this file contains macros. And some of these restrictions are set in the registry. So they unset uh, these, restrictions, these restrictions. Once they collected the information they want, they will uh, right here send it to uh, some server and they will pursue and uh, download another, um, another code. And 
eventually will run a reverse shell. So all of that happened only using a docx file that started the whole chain. And what is interesting about this specific file and this specific example is that it's an actual file uh, developed by the Gamma Radon APT, which is a Russian APT. And they target quite a lot Ukraine. And they target, well, in this specific document, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. And if we look at the, the document, it's actually well crafted. It's written in, uh, in Ukrainian and it looks quite official. <laughs> so, uh, and it's not the only example of Gamma Redon or other groups. So as you can see, these documents look um, very appealing. You would, you would want to maybe click the enable, but don't do that. Uh, and I, I opened up here, analyze because we can see the, the, the screenshots of this file. Of course, you can also open the file in a VM in your work, but make sure to, um, to unplug it from the network. And if we open up uh, the template so we can get uh, more information about the obfuscated parts of the VBA code. So instead of spending more time on uh, analyzing all these parts and building up the file and understanding what it does, uh, we can actually just upload to, to analyze. Um, <clears throat> so a recap of the tools, um, we showed you on the open source tools or community uh, tools. So the OLED tools and the RTF dumps uh, Dider Stevens has, has other um, open source tools which are very useful. And all the tools, if I didn't mention, it's uh, available on GitLab, on GitLab. And it's a suite of, I don't know, maybe 20, I'm not sure, but many, many files um, written in Python that are very useful to analyzing all the different types of Office files. Um, Next, we have for, for the, the dynamic execution, we have the source search and the CSDPG and blob runner, and also, oh, sorry, and the VBA debugger uh, that is part of the, of, the world, of the world. And lastly, we showed you for synthesizer analyze, uh, and we have a community version. So if you want to try that, and um, I think I will move to the question. Uh, okay, <laughs> there are quite a lot of things in chat. So if you have uh, a question, please write it down. Uh, the recorder, the recording, and the slides. Yes, you will get them. I'm very sorry about <laughs> if something wasn't readable. Uh, I'm reading all the single in the chat. <laughs> if you want, uh, all these files are available in various total. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm reading a lot of things on the chat and uh, I, I really hope and I'm glad uh, to read that you enjoyed. Um, so I, I want just to uh, maybe to answer a few questions that I think I saw in the beginning. So not every file that contains VBA will be malicious, but it's, it, it's a good sign that the file is malicious uh, because in these days, uh, most of the VBA is malicious. So when you see a macro, you should start to be suspicious about the file. Uh, a great question that I see here is about Vi Viper Monkey. So actually, I, I had Viper Monkey in the presentation. I wanted to show it. Uh, but the thing is that I tried it on a few random files and it, it, it broke, it didn't work for me. So I didn't feel so confident showing that and saying, hey, you should use that. I, I'm more trustful of all the tools or the, v, the VM and the sandboxes. But yes, Viper Monkey is a good tool um, just for the others. So Viper Monkey is an open source tool that emulates VBA code. 
So uh, for these examples that we had the heavily obfuscated VBA code, Viper Monkey uh, can help us deobfuscate it and, and, and present us with the deobfuscated version. So it's very useful, but unfortunately, uh, there are some techniques and some samples that uh, break it and it, it didn't work, but yeah. A a an excellent question about how to get the working flare set up. So that's a very good question. And I know that a few people uh, are struggling at the moment with flare. So uh, once I will know that, I will share that on Twitter, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, I know the struggle. Uh, how do we track phishing campaigns in Israel? So, um, <laughs> uh, so there, I think, like in every other country, um, we have, of course, phishing campaigns in Israel, and it's uh, very popular in different ways. It's not only using Office files; it's uh, over the SMSs on the phone and so on. But I the tracking is the same as everywhere, everywhere else, looking for uh, maybe for spoofed emails, uh, looking for emails uh, with attachments from a specific, maybe specific keywords and so on. Um, so feel free to, to continue uh, writing more questions. <laughs> um, are there other ways to hide VBA code? So yeah, uh, we talked about all obfuscated VBA code uh, and Oh, sorry for that. Uh, we had a different uh, ways to obfuscate VBA code, and it's not only uh, the things that we saw, there are other ways as well. So, for example, VBA uh, stomping, which means uh, uh, compile the VBA code, put it inside an Office file, and then remove the source code. So, uh, the document is left only with the compiled version. And for tools that scan only for source code VBA, they will miss it. And once you will open the document file, you will uh, the, the VBA code will be executed. So that's one way to bypass the tools and still have VBA code. Um, so I don't see more questions, <laughs> uh, but uh, I will, if you have more less questions, <laughs> and if not, I guess I will end up the session. Um, but if you have more questions that you think of, so please feel free to uh, to reach out. Uh, I'm on uh, on Twitter as well or by email. Um, and I, I see that you really like the session on the chat, and it really uh, makes me happy. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you want other sessions, if you have uh, topics that you would like uh, to have on your session, so uh, reach out. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Uh, I hope you learned uh, and it was interesting. And um, Yes, please reach out if you have more questions or suggestions. Oh, someone asked about my Twitter, so I will just <laughs> leave it right here. Sorry. That's here, right here, right. <laughs> so thank you so much and have a nice evening or day and a week. <laughs>